Chicken noodle god came down from the mountain. Chicken <laughs> said, Chicken noodle man, you gotta work all day. Chicken noodle man, you gotta cross the river Jordan. Feed the devil soup until your troubles go away. <laughs> and welcome to the Marxism Today podcast. I'm Tony Schmidt, and for this episode, Red Wagner and I were joined once again by Thad to answer a couple related questions that are part of sort of the series we've been doing, uh, having to deal with sort of basic questions or sort of common misconceptions um, that exist about socialism or communism or Marxism. So I hope you enjoy it, and here's our conversation. All right, another question then. Wouldn't everyone have to be altruistic for socialism to work? This is this is actually one of my favorite um, questions, and I think I think because my answer to it has morphed over time, maybe that's why I like it. Because originally I used to think uh, I had this same question myself when I was younger, and I, originally I used to think that mankind actually isn't as bad as as we paint mankind to be and that we actually have a lot of goodness in us and and things like that. I kind of answered that question in that format for a long time. But actually I I have a different answer now that I think is much better. And I guess my first point is mankind is both amazingly good and amazingly bad. We have the potential for both. So there you go. Here's the thing. With capitalism, what we're saying is we're going to give an amazing amount of power to a small group of people and hope that they do the right thing with it. And and we're going to hope that they, do, even though they don't have to deal with the effects of uh, letting everyone who assembled cars in Detroit be unemployed now because they moved production to a third world country... They don't have to deal with that, but we're going to let that person decide. I think we'd be far better off if all of the people in that car assembly plant decided together whether or not they were going to outsource that plant. So is socialism going to get rid of that greed and like all these other social ills? No, of course not. You know, people are people. But I think the assumption is socialism will never work unless people are perfect. Well, look at what we do with capitalism. We give massive incentives to do the wrong thing to people, and then they do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And that shouldn't really be a surprise. Like, it was the best move for that person to do this thing that hurt everyone else. Right. Why don't we put the big decisions in the hands of the people who will be affected by them? You know, so are we going to pollute this lake or whatever? Well, let's ask the people that live by that lake or who have drinking water that comes from that lake or whatever. Let's ask the people that are actually going to be affected, which are basically your your regular residents and your workers for almost any decision. And that's going to produce a more favorable outcome. So, you know, I think that, yeah, I want to actually flip it. That's why I like this answer is because the answer flips the question. You'd have to be a perfectly moral society for capitalism to work because it would mean that people that are given massive amounts of power would be able to do the right thing for other people, even if it hurts them. That's what you're asking of capitalism, and it doesn't work out. And I think it's because people are not perfect. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, let's have a society where we acknowledge that people are not perfect and then build rules that will end with, that will develop good results, even if people aren't perfect. Right. That's interesting because we, we alluded before to the, the whole absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, and or the Spider-Man version of Great Power Comes Great Responsibility. Uh, we, we alluded to that before, and it, it's, I, I really like that because what you're saying is in, instead of counting on that one person or many people, you know, to be to be just tyrants and, the, and have that power and be good with it, mm -hmm. why not, instead of giving absolute power, 
spread all that power out evenly. It's what we say is our, our, how our government's supposed to work, check and, checks and balances. If the idea of equal power is that everyone, if everyone has an equal voice, is that you do have checks and balances. You do have someone that can't necessarily take something over for their own self-interest because their own self-interest becomes the interest of everyone. Mm-hmm. It, it's part of it. That's um, a surprisingly good and very short answer. Like, I think that works really well for me, at least. It makes a lot of sense. I, I will add a little bit, not to the answer, because I do think that that's a very good answer, but I'll add the observation that when you do have a rich capitalist deciding that, oh, I have, you know, billions of dollars, I'm going to give basically what I found in my couch chair. Mm-hmm. Couch chair, my couch. Um, <laughs> He's so yeah, rich, he has a couch chair my... put together. <laughs> Whoa! Exactly. Yeah. Whole couch, one it's, chair. It's the couch that holds the chair. That yeah. it, it has to be so big because of all the this money they carry the in their pockets. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they give what to them is essentially change yeah. out to a charity or something. It's, oh my God, look oh, at what a great philanthropist yeah. they are. Yeah. Oh, look how great. So I think that capitalism does try to build the mythology that rich people do act altruistically um, mm-hmm. when they obviously don't. And it's why you don't hear a lot about reclusive billionaires who don't... Like, the Koch brothers weren't heard of until it was exposed what they were doing with their money, which was very not altruistic. Yeah. Whereas someone like Bill Gates, everyone has heard of because he does some, with his money, some sort of altruistic thing yeah i think with this question there's also an assumption here with this question that in a social society you would have the ability to to game the system to some extent Mm -hmm. and to to such an extent that it would break society and i don't think i think that is a misunderstanding of how that that society would work Yep, I, I I agree with you. Like the idea is that everyone could just take whatever they wanted or something like that. Like in some instances, that makes sense. Like we were talking about uh, on an earlier topic, the fact that once you've produced a piece of media that can be shared infinitely through the internet or whatever with no cost for distribution. Mm-hmm. You know, there's the cost to produce, but the distribution cost is none. So there, you know the in a socialist society, there wouldn't necessarily be the, a reason to punish someone for overindulging in media because it could be just infinitely consumed. But I guess maybe people are thinking that you could just go and, like, have 50 cars if you wanted 50 cars. Like, I think that's a good example. I, yeah, I don't think that that's necessarily the stance of socialists is that cars are free and we're just going to hope that nobody takes more than one. Like that's I, maybe, I don't know who, whose conception of socialism that is, but maybe that's implicit in the question. I, I, I do think that it, people's conception of that are people that just don't, they're not familiar with it because, you know, it's kind of demonized and they don't, they don't learn about it very often. Yeah. I think that that perception stems off of Ronald Reagan's welfare queen nonsense. <laughs> What's that? Um, It's the, you know, Oh, you have the person on welfare who drives like a Rolls Royce. I think he actually had like one person that I don't know if he actually found someone who was really gaming the system or if they just, you know, paid somebody to pretend like they were. It's, it's that though that, oh, well, you know, this is stereotypical that you have just mm-hmm. a promiscuous, normally African American woman just having babies left and right so she can collect these big fat paychecks for having kids and do nothing and be amoral and all that. Uh, I think that's part of where that comes from, is that Uh where the counter I always give to people is, okay, yep, I'm sure some people do game the system. Mm -hmm. It it happens, and, you know, I don't think it's very prevalent. And even if it were, even if you assumed that everyone on welfare was skimming an extra grand off the government... How much money does a capitalist corporation get by not paying taxes or cheating on their stuff? I mean, Google, yep. Apple, I mean, none of, neither of them, I don't think, has paid any taxes in years. How much, how many billions of dollars are we losing? How much more could we afford to pay people on welfare, you know, with that? And talking about corporations, I mean, making decisions to pollute water, I mean, do things to the environment, take people's jobs away and treat them poorly. Like, there's so, the damage done is so much higher 
even if you even if you do concede that guess that that some people are able to game welfare my guess is that in a lot of those cases like i have anecdotal evidence evidence by someone i know um in milwaukee where um she got she saw a good amount of that and my response was that in a lot of those cases the the, the nice cars you saw and stuff it was probably a, like it they were in a really crappy um, neighborhood. It was probably drug stuff. I mean, if you think about it, yeah. unless they had these people happen to have a good job, it probably were, no one's able to have a Rolls Royce on welfare. Like nobody can look. Go, go and look at what you're able to get. Yeah, you, like if it were so easy to get a Rolls Royce on welfare, like why don't the people complaining about it go on welfare and get their own Rolls yeah. Royce? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it is. It's 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 given as this like villain, like this mysterious figure that no one's ever really seen, but you're able to use it to villainize. Yeah, and also another reaction to that is to say that th- that person's gaming this crappy system where welfare is constantly tra- being cut apart, so that there's not enough money for oversight. It, if someone does game the system, it's because no one's there to sort of guide them. No one's there to double check on l- how they're using the money. It's because they're gaming this crappy system. We're talking about. Comp- completely separate system yeah that yeah. that you're not gaming the same thing like mm-hmm. yeah well and one of the main ironies is like one of the re- biggest reasons for having some sort of welfare is that people cannot find employment for themselves you know mm-hmm. you have unemployment insurance and all all these other kind of safety net things a lot of that stems from the capitalist system does does not see fit to employ that person However, if once you get rid of a lot of the mechanisms of capital, the idea, in fact, capital is the only, the, the, even other exploitative systems haven't had need for unemployment. Capital is the first one that we've invented as a species. So if you look at feudalism and slavery, there's no reason to have some of your slaves not work right now or to have some of your serfs not work right now. I mean, obviously, except for, like, you know, holidays or whatever, or mm-hmm. they have to rest or whatever. But, like, to have 10% of them that you choose that you're like, yeah, you just get to starve and die this year. The rest of I'm going to make everyone else work, and I'll give them stuff. But, mm-hmm. yeah, so the capitalism's the first economic system we've invented where we need structural unemployment to keep the system intact. And you're saying we need it because it allows for people to, what, for competition? Is it for something, to, you don't want to be unemployed, so you're going to take less at your in your wages and things like, like that? Yep, 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 okay. exactly, yeah. There becomes big problems for capitalists if we ever do reach full employment. Right. So it's, it's favorable to capitalists if we maintain a certain level of unemployment. Mm-hmm. Um, however, but it's the, it's the first social structure where you, the ruling class has a built-in incentive to keep some of the working class unemployed. Mm. Depending on what your vision of socialism is going to be if you choose to be a socialist, most likely you can find a way to structure society where the people who feel like contributing are able to contribute in some way and receive some compensation for that. And so they're doesn't necessarily need to be uh, unemployment. And, you know, a lot of people are willing to work if they can find something that's not demeaning, that, you know, they feel is is valuable to them and treats them like a human being and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. In in socialism, how, who's going to be the janitor? Who's going to do the crappy jobs no one wants? Uh-huh. And that's that. It, it's kind of tied to altruism, but it's it's tied to who's going to take on those kind of things, and how do you incentivize that, or you know, that kind of thing. What I've heard and agree with that I think would work best for something like that is then you simply have more janitors who work less time. That the sort of more demanding physically or less appealing tasks are spread out amongst more people. That way. They don't, you know, you don't have one person resentful that all they do with all this time. So in exchange for doing the crappier job, you do less of it and you have more free time. Mm -hmm. I could see taking that job for that. Yeah, and that would make more people want to do it and then maybe you have less, you know, Mm -hmm. sort of a supply and demand thing to fill positions. That makes sense to me, especially when we talk about, uh, I mean, with technology, with the with the real amount of wealth in this country and how how many people we could just take care of and, and just give the give a home to give enough food every month to live and, and give electricity and everything we could literally just do that and all live pretty well 
um, and not have things change for like the middle class and things get better for the lower class. But then, yeah, I mean, you could you could very easily. You, people have been talking for like 50 years now about shortening the the work week even more um, since like the 60s and 70s. That not much uh, traction has been made with that. But yeah, you pretty easily could. Um, yeah, that's what I do have a different answer. Oh, okay. oh, cool. I mean, I th- I think that yours is is. A good one, but I want to come at it from a different perspective, too, to offer other options. So the first thing I want to say is I have worked as a janitor before, and I actually did not mind the work. There were certain parts of it that I took a lot of pride in and really enjoyed. And the main reason why I stopped doing that and I'm not a janitor now is because I can make a lot more money doing something else. I also enjoy what I do, probably more than being a gender, but I didn't dislike it. Okay. So it doesn't strike me as something that will be particularly hard to fill uh, as a position if it, it if it's needed. You know, we talked a lot about automation earlier today, but uh, assuming that there is some need for someone to do that, I, I don't think that it would be bad. Now, Tony's response was was, I think, a good response because it gets to the core of your question, Mm -hmm. which is not necessarily... Because what I'm saying is, well, maybe gender isn't a good example, right? Basically, I'm saying maybe people might still want to be genders. I think Tony's answer applies to the the heart of the question, which is, what about a job that nobody wants to do? Sure. And then, yeah, obviously there are ways to make it more appealing, like shorter hours for that particular job or whatever it almost sounds like a market thing i mean in a in a way yeah yeah Yeah. absolutely yeah i mean because it's more dollars per hour Mm. yeah in fact i'm i wouldn't even necessarily be against providing more dollars for that job Mm -hmm. but look at what we have now you picked a position that and we could probably come up with other ones. So I said gender might not be a good example, but we could come up with a bunch of other examples of not favorable jobs. Yeah. But I would bet you that most of those jobs actually pay quite low. Mm-hmm. Like that's the capitalist. The capitalist answer is to pay those jobs more because they are not favorable to have. Well, unfortunately, that's not the way that capitalism actually works in practice. Mm -hmm. You know, it finds the people that get to make most of the decisions in capitalism and gives them highly rewarding jobs, oftentimes very demanding ones, but at the same time, very rewarding jobs that fulfill their need for creativity and leadership and blah, 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 and also rewards them with vast sums of money. Usually the most mentally empowering jobs are also the most highly compensated. Then the jobs that beat you down more than any other jobs, the most demeaning jobs are also at the same time the the lowest paid. So the I mean one way to solve that in a socialist society is to say well we could reverse that. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. You know the, the, I don't you know I don't know if that's necessarily the right answer but you could actually pay demeaning jobs more. Mm-hmm. Well, you know and I'm not necessarily against that. You know you you could find some socialists that say that we absolutely must have everyone make the exact same amount of money uh every year and I'm not necessarily going to go that extreme. Uh, I think it's okay if, but this is the thing, if we as that person's co-workers or the, the people that live with that person or whoever, if we as the community agree that that person has made a sacrifice above and beyond, then we can award that person with, with more money or more commodities or whatever, or, or with shorter working hours. I think that's okay. What we have right now is the people with vast sums of money get to decide how much person each person receives. And so they, you know, they identify with that CEO and they do not identify mm-hmm. with the custodian at all. And, and so there, you know, it really shouldn't be a surprise that one of them makes a lot of money and the other one makes very little when you could argue that, you know, one of them has a, a very favorable, rewarding job and the other one has, does not. So, I mean, already it's hard to imagine that we would do a worse job of balancing those mm. with a different system because we're doing a pretty bad job right now. There's another way to also come at this same question, which I think might even be a harder way to answer it, which is the question, well, who will become a doctor? 
because certain jobs are very difficult. Like you mm-hmm. need to really study hard. You need to know a lot of stuff. You need to memorize all these different parts of the body and all probably a bunch of diseases. You know, I don't know exactly what goes into being a doctor. Years and years of but, school and but, hard work. Yeah, yeah exactly. So the, another question, which I think is the harder one to answer, mm-hmm. is how are we going to incentivize people to do the very difficult jobs? But I'm not sure that that, I mean, maybe we kind of answered it with the earlier question. You know, with those difficult jobs often comes prestige and and respect and and a sense of accomplishment. And, and these are all big, big motivators. In fact, there's a lot of research these days about, how, you know, what motivates people. And it's actually a, a lot of it is stuff completely outside of monetary compensation. There's a lot of studies to show that monetary compensation is a really good motivator up to a certain amount. And then once you've reached, you know, a pretty modest amount, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe not modest, but like $50,000 or whatever, Mm -hmm. something around that. Once people reach a comfortable living, money ceases to be a strong motivator. And what becomes a stronger motivator are things like feeling like you have control in Mm -hmm. the workplace, feeling like you are respected, feeling like you are good at the thing that you do. And all of those things are things that can come with being a doctor. So that that's the first point, is that even when we're talking about a highly difficult job, I think you can say there's a lot of motivators, there's a lot of reasons why maybe it wouldn't even be a problem in the first place. But let's go ahead and, and... play the devil's advocate and say, okay, even with all of those incentives, we still don't have enough doctors. Well, then we can play the same game that we were Mm -hmm. playing before. We can deviate a little bit from, especially if we as a community have decided, okay, this person has worked especially hard and deserves extra compensation for that. And we deserve a doctor. We deserve more doctors too. I mean, that's part of it. We want that. It's for our community. Yep. yep. Let's let's get, pay them more money so we get more. Yep. That's, that's entirely different from the CEO of a large healthcare organization deciding how much a doctor should be paid Mm -hmm. versus how much the medical assistant should be paid. If we as a community and the people and the workers in that industry all decide, okay, this person, you know, if someone does this job, yes, it is harder and they deserve a little bit more for it. I'm okay with that. But the thing is, I don't think that people will, if given that structure, because this is the next thing that someone might say, is given that structure, aren't people just going to reproduce the wealth differences that we have right now? I don't think so. Like, I don't think you're going to go into a voting booth or or raise your hand in a meeting for a verbal vote or whatever, like whatever mechanism we have, I don't think the workers in that industry are going to vote to say the lowest rung here, you know, the, the gender or whatever, whoever the lowest rung happens to be, should get paid $8 an hour. But that CEO, geez, he, he deserves another $10 million this year. Mm-hmm. I don't think, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I don't think that people are going to do that. Right. Well, and even if they do, that's where taxes come in, is then you just have the tax system set up where if somebody makes $10 million, you go, great, that's phenomenal. We are taking, you know, $9.5 million of your $10 million or, you know, I don't know, however much we de- it's decided upon. Mm-hmm. But you'd have a, a limit where at some point you have a 100% tax rate. Yeah. It's a way to get around people doing that. Yep. And one thing that was important for me to, to think of as we were talking about this is the biggest differences that I think we would see between, like, if we went to sleep tonight with capitalist society and woke up tomorrow with the socialist one, is not the doctors necessarily. They, they might, I mean, though, like we've talked about, perhaps they'd still make more. It is the, the pure capitalists. It is the ones that own business, like giant mega corporations that mm-hmm. is that 1% not existing and where all, where all that wealth is. Mm-hmm. Um, that it, we, you don't get to see that. It's, it's like the fact, the amount of money they have is inconceivable to our minds. Mm-hmm. And it's also sort of out of our vision when we talk about this in, in the, in the, in the public mm-hmm. sphere. Like that's going to be the real change. Those guys don't deserve, you know, the 85,000 times 
salary that for, uh, higher than the janitor, whatever it is. You know, like they're not actually working that much more. You can't believe a person deserves that much more. And that's really where the change would be. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Like uh, one of my favorite pieces of information that I picked up recently was that Sam Walton's, I think it's his widow, his, his uh, wife who's still alive. And, and actually most of the Waltons are this way, but his um, wife I think has more stock than any of the rest of them in, in Walmart. But the dividends that she receives every day are equivalent, if not greater, than depending on what lottery you look at. Basically, she wins the lottery every day. Mm. Like, mm. She, she gets just wild amounts of money every day simply for owning stock. She, doesn't, she literally doesn't have to do anything mm -hmm. to get that money. And, I, I mean, maybe she's a very nice person. That's fine. But I... I I don't think that we would have a society where we'd say, okay, some people, you're going to have to go to bed hungry mm -hmm. so that this person gets to win the lottery literally every single day. You know, when talking about this and we're giving several different answers, I think to some people that might sound weird because well, so we're socialists or Marxists or... Don't you have it? Well, you know, this is socialism. And I think it's important to realize that, one, Marx never wrote on stone tablets, this is communism, or this is socialism, or this is Marxism. He barely touched on that idea. Um, we mentioned this a little bit last time, that, you know, the Soviets, you know, were struggling, or Marx struggled with one question to the aspect of it, and then people started working on others. It's not a completely worked out system, but I don't think that's a problem when we're talking about transitioning to it because I think it's simply more honest than capitalism because capitalism pretends like they have the answers and they know everything and they just have it all figured out. Like they always have the air of, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, it's capitalism. But they don't at all. And I think it's much more honest to say, yes, there are different options for socialism. There are different ways we can try this. And if we don't like something, we can simply decide together we need to change this because we don't like it. That seems like a big point is that it's very adaptable. It, with the people that are that are going to be affected by a change and the people that are going to be implementing a change, they are all the ones making the decision. And if something goes wrong or they need to go another direction, it's probably going to be pretty clear when that happens. And you can continue to make these choices instead of having one person who is perhaps detached from the consequences of their actions, who's going to make as much money as they're going to anyway. Like you were mentioning before, mm -hmm. that them, they are, have an incentive to be entrenched and not change things. They have an incentive to support the status quo when um, a bunch of a bunch of workers getting together and and ha thinking about debating this and then making decisions. That seems like it could be very fluid and um, and make changes quickly. Yeah, yeah, there there is no one socialism. I mean, we've seen in the world now. If you look around at the different nations, there's lots of different capitalisms. Capitalism is managed in a lot of different ways. Yeah. So I I'd imagine that there'd be equal amount of different socialisms and and since we don't know exactly where it'll go right now that the, there's actually a, a wide open field for exactly what socialism will be or what it will mean but i think you get a feel from listening anyway or or from reading marx you know that there are certain general principles that guide what socialism means it's not that it means everything but the playing field of which or the realm of possibility within socialism is it's there, I guess. I don't know. I don't know the right way to say it. Is the it, limits are yeah. imagination. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, sort of. Yeah, that, I mean, that's uh, maybe that's too <laughs> catchphrasey for me to say. It's a little but, reading rainbow, but yeah. I like it. But just yeah, like Cliff Burton. <laughs> it's yeah, it's not all worked out. There are going to be lots of different kinds of socialisms, and uh, I'm sure it'll morph over time. There is no one. This is socialism, and nothing else is. Right. <laughs> Thank you.
This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Tony Schmidt and Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.